My name is Dawn Dole, and I am the executive director for the Taos Institute. The Taos Institute is a nonprofit educational organization, and our mission is to bring together scholars and practitioners concerned with the social processes essential for the construction of reason, knowledge, and human value, and their application and relational, collaborative, and appreciative practices around the world. Constructionist theory and practice locates the source of meaning, value, and action in the relational connection among people. And our focus is on how social groups and the relational practices within those groups create and sustain beliefs in the real, the rational, and the good. And we recognize that as people create meaning together, so do they sow the seeds of action. Meaning and action are entwined. And as we generate meaning together, we create the future. We have programs such as our diploma program, workshops, courses, online um, conferences, face-to-face -face conferences, book publications, webinars, and more. And we invite you to visit our website at any time for manuscripts and dissertations and videos, lots and lots of resources for your use around social construction. Today is our Dialogue with the Author series. It's a monthly series. It's free and open to everyone. And each month we feature a book inviting the author or authors of that book to be in conversation. And this dialogue today is part of a six month series on the new SAGE Handbook of Social Constructionist Practice. Today we explore section six of the handbook, which is practices in healthcare. So again, I would just like to welcome everyone to this dialogue with the author. And um, so glad that you're here. And I'm gonna turn it over to um, Siliani Camargo Borges, who is one of the um, editors of this handbook. So Siliani, let me get you on spotlight. Here we go. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Great to see you all. Some familiar faces here. Um, on behalf of my co-editors, uh, Mary Gergen, who we dearly miss, and I'm sure somehow she's here with us. Sheila McNamee, who is right here, digitally present. Emerson Hazera, also digitally present here. I want to say that um, I want to thank you all for being here and to say that this handbook was a remarkable experience um, to all of us. And it has been a collaborative journey throughout the entire process. Just for you to know, we have four editors. We have section sector editors. We have 93 authors. We have an international advisory board. We had four anonymous uh, reviewers. So you can see it was a truly constructionist adventure of combining all the diversity of expertise, experiences and cultures and styles and putting it all together in this book where we show some constructionist ideas and how these ideas are flourishing and innovate in different contexts. So it turned out we have a book of 60 chapters featuring some creative and innovative work where we share some global constructionist ideas implemented in local contexts. It's very beautiful to see how this book is taking many forms and shapes now that it's published. We are having all these meetings gathering together for all these different sections. And also I want to share with you that we have a podcast featuring some of the chapters so you can listening, I'm gonna uh, share in the chat the link it was made by our wonderful interviewer, Robin Stratton from the Positivi uh, Positivity Strategist. And some authors talk a bit more in depth about uh, their chapters. Today, we are here for the section six, um, many experiences all across the healthcare arena. And um, our section editor is Murilo Mosqueta a professor from the State University in Maringá. It was wonderful to work with Murilo on this section. And uh, besides uh, being my personal and dear friend, Brazilian friend, uh, he's very competent 
in everything he does. So in his academic work, in his practices, and he's very innovative in everything he does. So it was a great pleasure to work with here and to have him throughout this journey. And he will tell us more about the section and the topics that we're gonna be uh, talking today. So the floor is yours, Murilo, thank you. Thank you so much, Celiani. Uh, good morning, afternoon or evening, everyone, depending on where you are. Uh, it's a challenge and a great pleasure to be, to be with you here to celebrate and to present the healthcare section of this book. I want to thank the editors of the book for the, the amazing work and, and for bringing together people from different contexts to collaborate. And I want to welcome the authors and say in advance that it was such a privilege to work with you. Thank you so much for your effort and thank you for sharing your ideas and practices. It gives us comfort to know that social constructionist ideas move us as a community to transform our healthcare practices. And I want to welcome all of you who are interested in the book. I hope that in the next hour, we can give you a glimpse of, of the richness of this section. So, the chapters we have gathered in this section beautifully display how healthcare can be transformed as we consider the relational dimension as the center of our practices. They attempt to expand traditional definitions of health and illness, to promote contextually and culturally sensitive approach to patients, to amplify collaboration in interdisciplinary work and to highlight the human dimension of care. In the text I wrote as an introduction for this section, I call this practice political, collaborative and creative. And I think it is a good description of what you will find in the chapters. But today I would like to add a bit to this description. And, and I would like to say that these three words, political, collaborative, and creative, should not be taken separately, but in relation to one another. And that would help us to ask, for example, how political and collaborative are our creations? And how political and creative are our collaborations? and how collaborative and creative are our politics. I believe that this could give us a sense of direction in troubling times. After all, what is the use of being creative in healthcare if not to challenge power and privilege and to transform the inequalities that are killing us all, some faster than others. According to the World Health Organization, until April, the richest countries got 87, 87% of coronavirus vaccine shots, while the poorest countries got only 0.2. And this is not okay. And we could do better than that. The chapters in the sections were written before this virus was on our site. However, as I go through these pages, I can find the voice of researchers and practitioners committed to change this, wor this word by recreating the way we take care of each other. So yes, we are better than that. So I hope these ideas inspire you as well. The first chapter <clears throat> we are going to present today is called Towered Relational Engagement, Poetic Reflection in Healthcare. 
In this chapter, authors Arlene Katz and Kathleen Clark invite the artist Elizabeth Jameson to participate in the writing by reflecting on her experience of living with multiple sclerosis. This text offers us a precious opportunity to exercise what the authors are as a fundamental resource for the transformation of care relations in times dominated by biotechnology, listening to what the patient has to say. What if the waiting rooms <clears throat> were meeting places where people could tell about their experiences? What if health professionals did not shy away from looking at death, loss, and the incurable? What if they could find in these experiences the possibilities of being curious and interested in the unique experience that unfolds before them? So let's listen to them. Thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. I'm Kathy Clark, one of the authors of Chapter 49, Towards Relational Engagement, Poetic Reflections in Healthcare. By way of background, I've known Elizabeth James for about 15 years, having spent many hours in her studio talking about our ideas, our lives, and our various projects. When I first met Elizabeth, she was uh, an artist having transitioned from law into soon after being diagnosed with MS. One of her many thoughtful and creative projects has been her waiting room project, which she developed after sitting in silence with so many others in physicians' waiting rooms. She was determined to find an approach to building community among the people she in so many waiting rooms over the years. When I realized that Arlene had mentored a student working on a waiting room project, I suggested to Arlene that we talk to Elizabeth about using her life and her wonderful work as the subject of our chapter. Our discussions developed into a chapter with Elizabeth rather than a chapter about Elizabeth Jameson. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Um, uh, we'd like to start in an unusual way, inviting you to enter into the life of Elizabeth Jameson, one of our co-authors, and asking you to notice with her what matters. Um, Don, if you could start the video, that'd be good. I'm a patient. I have multiple sclerosis. I'm a quadriplegic. So I have insight into the fact the United States does not have human-centered design and how medical care is organized in this country. We, we organize healthcare around diseases, not people. And because of this, patients often feel ignored or isolated or oftentimes invisible in the whole healthcare arena. And I'm an artist and my contribution to trying to make this whole crazy healthcare system more attainable is to use my skills as an artist to provide images or make images which spark conversation amongst patients. So there's, we have discussions together about our diseases and our hope is that conversations will continue on patient to provider, patient to scientists. So that's our goal is to have images that can create and ignite conversation. We don't want a healthcare system where people are ignored or invisible. Every person deserves to be seen as a full human being. And we need to be as full human being in the healthcare, healthcare system should have incentives so that physicians can listen to 
the everyday stories of patients. And they and healthcare system would incentivize providers to talk to their patients, encourage patients to talk about and develop their personal stories. You're out, Jordan. Thank you. Um, so in our chapter, we invite the reader to participate in this dialogue let me get the text in, sorry. Uh, with Elizabeth, which we have, we have begun by entering into the video, as she reflects on her illness experience with MS and how it has been transformed by creating art with her MRI, MRI scans. Using this as a way to, as she says, ignite and spark conversations, a form of relational engagements with professionals and patients about care. So rather than write about her, we reflect with her. And again, we take this a step further and our style of writing is a poetic enactment of our engagement with each other. Noticing what we are struck by in dialogue with each other to make visible what is at stake and what can, can be carried over into practices of care and into our lives. As Elizabeth articulates what she is moved by in dialogue with us, she makes visible what matters which often can go by unnoticed in how it can be carried into practice. So this got us to explore the intertwined relational domains of sacred spaces, acknowledgement, care, and caregiving. So the question is how to create, invite these safe spaces that become sacred spaces of care. As we wrote in the chapter, the act of being acknowledged in space between one and another, a felt sense beyond a particular physical space can create new meaning and possibilities. To acknowledge, to walk with another is a relational process, an attunement to what matters most each actor. It can transform the space between them into a sacred liminal space. I would go one step further here in Murillo and say, it is also a space of um, solidarity. So uh, poetic expression, as John Berger says, makes language care because it renders everything intimate. There is often nothing more substantial to place against the cruelty and indifference of the world than this caring. Uh, I have the pleasure of introducing Ellen Raboyne and Paul Eulig's chapter entitled Collaborative Reconstruction of Healthcare. I've known Ellen for almost 20 years. We both did our PhD dissertations at different institutions on healthcare related topics. As a result, we began spending substantial amounts of time talking about and writing about various aspects of healthcare. I met Paul through Ellen about five years ago and have followed his work ever since. Their chapter focuses on how conversations and interactions in healthcare can be transformed by adopting an orientation of relational social construction, focusing on conversations and interactions from a co-creative lens. The authors ask, what are we making together? How are we making it? And what is, it poss what is possible now that wasn't possible before? New worlds of healthcare can be intentionally collaboratively reconstructed. Doctors Raboyne and Ulig suggest that we take the highest level of meaning in healthcare from fighting disease to the peace that can accompany the human condition. That's peace, P-E-A-C. The hope is that we can now construct our healthcare to focus more on people in the human condition, not to the exclusion of disease, of course, but always ensuring that people come first. Something that struck me was the narrative of Janae and Alfred highlighting this gentle impact a loving collaborative approach had on the patient, Alfred and his family. On the other hand, Janae was left alone, isolated and frustrated. The social field defined by Ellen and Paul as a living collective intelligence that grows among a group of people as they work 
learned together had expanded to new thinking and new practices in support of and collaboration with Alfred and his family in their experience of healthcare. Welcome, Ellen and Paul. Ellen, you're muted. I'm, oh, sorry. How about now? You're good now. Perfect. I might actually need to mute this. You're muted, Ellen. Okay. All right, let's try this. Let me mute this one. How's that? That's good. Here Sorry, you. I lost connection earlier. I have to hang this up. And also, Ellen, <clears throat> I can't get Paul on the video because he doesn't have his video on. So you will just need to converse with him verbally. Okay, yeah, good. Good to know Paul is here. I think he's in an ICU actually living the life. <laughs> so let me turn this off. Okay, um, so we have three big points to make here uh, that we are grateful to the Taos community really for uh, bringing these to light for us. The first one is a Bateson idea that the context really holds what's possible when people are interacting. And the, the second thing came from really Pierce's work on the highest level of meaning, the hierarchy of meaning. And we came to understand that what we're really doing is moving from the context of disease and all of the possibilities that come with that, fighting disease and war, to a context that is more human and brings the human potential with it. So we began then to look at the conditions, or as Paul would say, the preconditions for bringing human potential to life as a healing context. And so the work became all about looking at the everyday interactions that are inside the healing context. And you'll see if you read the chapter, we began to call that a, a social field because we noticed from the literature of good people all over the world and our own work that not all interactions are equal when it comes to building a context for healing. And so those two things, looking at how to build a context in the traditional healthcare world, like an ICU, um, and then also looking at the social processes that then are possible in those preconditions. So that that's sort of the guts of it, but I also want to acknowledge Sheila, if she's here, uh, and the understanding of the thing that you do over and over and over really creates the social field. So we tried to highlight then, when we're asked this question over and over, how do we do this? <laughs> you know, um, oh, good, Paul's on. Yeah. Um, we, we try to, to keep it to exactly the everyday interactions, the openings that you have, in particular to invite and welcome the family into creating this healing environment because it's about them and it's about the providers. It's about being human. So that's an example. Paul, are you able to speak? Would you like to, like to add in here? Oh, we can't hear you. Okay, that's all right. I think if Paul was able to speak, he would talk to the significance of the preconditions and hard, how hard they are to stand in both worlds, to uh, enact the things that we know as human that are important uh, while in the traditional world and how important it is to do that in relation with other people that are actually doing it. 
So one of the things that we've encouraged is a learning network. And to see all of this as an active reflection um, learning cycle, starting with creating a place in our everyday life in the hospital for the team members to reflect together, to learn together. And we see that that movement of, of growing together and learning together as part of building the resources, the relational resources that make it possible to have care in a different way for each other, not only the patient. You know, I'm sorry I wasn't watching time. Somebody might tell me if I'm close. <laughs> um, Paula wish you could speak to anything else is coming. That's kind of what we had to say. Just the attention on the context and sometimes it's local. And sometimes it's across not only professionals but geographical designs. So one of the things that you have to do is reorganize the geography. Yeah, so that's one of the things that I, I, we heard that already from Dearest Elizabeth, about the, the things, the experiences that are generated because of the way that we're organized. So it's our work to reorganize that. Hi, Karen. I think it's uh, our honor now to introduce you. And I, I just have to tell you how, how grateful I was as I read your chapter because of the contribution to humanizing healthcare and um, specifically the exercises that Karen offers. If you've not seen them, go and look. They're, they're really important for any of you that are involved in educating, uh, especially interprofessionally. Uh, exercise, for example, I think speaks to this power of the context and helps people play with that idea. And exercise three, I think points to the connections. One of the first social processes that we take seriously. So um, thank you for that. And exercise two, a poem on they don't tell you. I think that connects to the way Elizabeth was talking and of some of the opportunities that we need to establish meaning of what we're doing. So overall, we're struck by uh, the straightforwardness of narr narrative medicine that Karen will present uh, and its ability to change the relational context where healing happens. So thank you, Karen. Thank you so much, Ellen. Um, appreciate your words. Um, yeah, as Ellen said, my chapter is um, called Words Matter, and it's how we might want to explore promoting relationality in healthcare um, through something called narrative medicine. Uh, for people who are not familiar with that, um, narrative medicine is a field of study and practice. Um, it's defined by Rita Sharon as the ability to acknowledge, absorb, and act on the stories and plights of others. So the mission of narrative medicine is, um, is relational. And I wanted to look at bringing together the narrative medicine community of practice and literature with the social constructionist literature and community of practice. Um, bring them more indirect conversation with each other because I felt there were so many resonances. So that's partly what the chapter is about. The other purpose for me in writing the chapter was to really draw on some of the social constructionist concepts that I have found most powerful uh, in my work and in my writing and try to use that as a lens to deepen the understanding of narrative medicine and its aims. So I looked, for example, at the idea of relational responsibility, uh, especially as Sheila and others have articulated it in terms of professional practice ethics 
and that ethics needs to be situated in the interactive moment and in relationship, not in abstract principles. And I also looked at the idea of relational being as articulated uh, by Ken and by others around the individual as a multi-being. And this had a lot of resonance for me as both a clinician and an educator. And um, Ken had said in his book, Relational Being, being a multi-being is how we can be available to each other, not as partial and carefully monitored facades, but as fully fragile and many-sided human beings that carry the traces of our past relationships. So this is really beautiful to me, this idea. And I wanted to use that to look at some of the narrative medicine um, text and some of the narrative medicine methods. Narrative medicine itself is very concerned, as are we as social constructionists, um, on language, on the acts of listening, on the what they call the intersubjective field, we might call the relational field. And at heart, it's also a pedagogy. It's an approach. And it uses the methods borrowed from literary theory, which is close reading of narrative texts usually poems, short stories, personal essays. It can also be video and art as text. It also uses reflective and creative writing, which is usually in response to the text. And it usually also involves an opportunity to read our writing to others in the context of some kind of group setting. So there's very, um, mu there's multiple relational dimensions going on within these activities as we read, as we write, um, writing itself is a relational act, as we read to each other, as we listen, as we witness each other's writing. So there are rela multiple relational acts going on in narrative medicine activities themselves. I also wanted to make the chapter uh, practical. Um, and as Ellen said, I've included an appendix with about four exercises, I think, centered on more clinician stories. And I wanted to share very briefly one of the stories that I include in the chapter, uh, partly because it's by Raphael Campo, who has really influenced my work. He's a physician and a poet, um, but also because I think it speaks to so many levels of practice for us as clinicians, as educators, as patients or family members, but also for us as readers, as witnesses. So Campo writes, I am reminded of one of my residents who was called to run a code on a patient in the hospital just as she was about to leave for the day and enjoy some time with her young family. She had followed all the biomedical protocols and algorithms perfectly, barking orders to the nurses and the interns with all the confidence she could muster. However, like most end of life interventions in the hospital, this one too proved futile and the patient died. Perhaps most salient of all was that she had sacrificed to the biomedical exigencies of the moment, the tuning out of the family who were present in the room. She wished she hadn't ignored them, but instead had allowed them to stop her before a full 30 minutes had passed when it was amply clear to all of them that their mother was dead. So this story for me um, speaks on many levels. Uh, it's a teaching story. It's also a story of um, calling us as readers and as listeners to what our responsibility is to the story. And that's really what narrative medicine is to me at heart. It is what is our responsibility to the story? What is our responsibility as witnesses to make healthcare a more relational and compassionate uh, enterprise? So I'll segue into uh, William's um, chapter and introducing it. Uh, William's chapter is called Strengthening Our Stories in the Second Half of Life, Narrative Resilience Through Narrative Care. And uh, it was such a beautiful segue for me to read William's story and to hear his work on narrative perspectives on aging and what beautifully is termed aging as a biographical, not just a biological process. Um, and that really the developmental task of aging is a narrative one. And William goes through many concepts of narrative identity and narrative environment and narrative challenges and narrative development. 
But two ideas really resonated for me working in this area. One was the idea that healthcare is an environment of narrative deprivation and what William calls narrative atrophy, where stories are so seldom invited. And that really spoke to my experience as a clinician, a patient, an educator. And the other thing that really struck me about the chapter was in a way William's anecdote, antidote, which was narrative care. And what does that look like? And really, um, I found the idea of the act of the art of storytelling and story listening, very beautiful, telling our stories in ways that make us stronger. And finally, what I really appreciated about William's chapter was that even though there were many formal ways that we can invite storytelling in healthcare, particularly for people who are aging, you know, writing groups and narrative therapy groups and storytelling activities, also the point was that we can see every interaction as an opportunity for the telling and retelling of our stories. And that really gives us limitless possibilities. So thank you, William, and I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Karen. Um... Uh, fellow Canadian. Um, I go by Bill, actually. But uh, anyway, to give you folks a, a sense of what's in my chapter, and Karen has really helped with that, um, I consider myself a narrative gerontologist. And narrative gerontology uh, borrows from narrative psychology, narrative therapy, and narrative medicine in viewing human beings as hermeneutical beings, in other words, as, as makers of meaning whose main means of making meaning in, is in many ways by telling or imagining and sharing stories. So narrative gerontology, as Karen suggests, focuses on the biographical dimensions of aging uh, and sees identity work as something that continues all life long, where identity is defined uh, by someone like Dan McAdams as a life story. In other words, an, an internalized and evolving narrative or personal myth that provides us with a sense of unity, coherence, and purpose. But we never compose our lives in a vacuum. A narrative perspective, as I see it, is, is very much a relational one. Uh, we story and restory our identities, ourselves, not by ourselves, uh, but within a web of narrative environments, which is the term that Karen mentioned. Uh, and those range from the families that we've been brought up in to the relationships that we're part of, the communities and institutions that we're embedded in. Our stories are entwined then often intensely with uh, those of others, continually co-authoring one another's life stories such that where my story ends and your story begins becomes impossible to say. A project that, that I've been involved in with colleagues at my university uh, is, has been exploring the narrative dimensions of resilience in later life. And we've hypothesized a, a link between the degree of resilience that older adults bring to the many challenges of aging and the richness or thickness or strength of the stories that they can tell about themselves. Our hypothesis being that the richer, thicker, or stronger the story, the greater the inner resources that they can bring to, uh, to, to later life. Uh, but with age, uh, the environments that we story our lives within can often get narrower and thinner. Uh, nursing homes, sadly, uh, despite noble efforts to, to foster a home-like environment, can be terribly bleak uh, environments from a narrative perspective with little support provided for residents' continued identity development. And concurrent with such changes in our narrative environments are several narrative tasks, as I call them, or narrative challenges uh, that we face as we get older. And I look at a number of these in my chapter. Among these challenges are narrative loss, the loss of people and routines that remind us of who we are and what our story is or stories are. Narrative dispossession is a term coined by one of my colleagues, uh, Clive Baldwin, that captures how uh, as we age, particularly if uh, we have some cognitive decline, other people with the best of intentions can end up stereotyping us uh, and de-storying us as somehow less than full persons. Another challenge is narrative disorientation, which is linked, I think, to Arthur Frank's concept of a chaos narrative. And for some older adults, as they wrestle with disability, etc their sense of who they are and what their story is, is thrown into a degree of disarray. Then there's the challenge of narrative foreclosure, which has been defined as the premature conviction that our life as a story has effectively ended, that no new chapters or adventures lie in store for us. Narrative atrophy, which Karen has mentioned, is a reality as well, particularly when we're in an environment where very few other people will invite us to tell 
our stories. Um, and that brings to mind a comment by Arthur Kleinman, one of the pioneers of narrative medicine, uh, who puts it in one of his writings, um, few of the tragedies at life's end are as rending to the clinician as that of the frail elderly patient who has no one to tell their story to. So near the end of my chapter, I sketch ways in which in our practice, we can assist folks in strengthening their stories and keeping them open through some form of narrative care, which is a broad term uh, that basically means for me, listening closely, respectfully, and openly to or for a person's stories or story. And it takes in formal psychotherapy on one end of the spectrum to uh, storytelling circles, reminiscence groups, guided autobiography, and just listening on the other end. Benefits uh, that have been identified uh, include decreased anxiety and depression in later life and an increased sense of purpose, meaning, agency, and self-esteem. But it's the relationship that's the key in narrative care. As one writer says, you can't tell who you are unless someone is listening. So at base, narrative care is, as Karen says, helping people to tell their stories in ways that make them stronger. This gives me the honor to uh, uh, segue into Lorraine Hedkes, and I hope I'm pronouncing your, your last name correctly, Lorraine, your wonderful chapter entitled From an Individual to a Relational Model of Grief. And I'd like to start by saying that uh, I wish I had, I really wish I had read this chapter, Lorraine, when I was uh, back in the 1980s when I was a parish minister with the Protestant uh, uh, faith uh, in my native Canada. I could definitely have used uh, the insights that you that you articulate in your chapter uh, as I was engaged in kind of a seat of the pants form of counseling uh, uh, to parishioners who were dealing with grief and bereavement. Um, but like many others at the time, I was kind of working implicitly with a Kubler-Ross sort of paradigm, which has its strengths. But in your chapter, you uh, nicely critique that sort of traditional approach. Um, uh, as, a, as in effect separating the living from the dead in a way that uh, can be very unnecessary in terms of the, of, the, of the stories by which people continue to live. So the dead person is both literally and figuratively banished in the cemetery, as you suggest, and rendered invisible. And the goal of the, for the bereaved person in this sort of more traditional model is to let go and move on. Uh, in your words, Emotional distance is supported at the expense of relational connections, and that really resonated with me. Throughout uh, uh, her chapter, Lorraine incorporates excerpts from a remembering conversation, I like that phrase, with someone named Cameron who had lost his grandmother. Uh, and those excerpts make clear just how much that woman had loved and supported Cameron in an unconditional kind of way. Uh, and it underscores your point, Lorraine, about how in a counseling context, there's so much value of reviving and keeping alive positive memories and positive stories of our relationship with the deceased as a tremendous source of strength and I would say resilience as we go forward. So I just think this is a really helpful chapter. Wish I had read it 30, 40 years ago, and I look forward to hearing what you have to say about it yourself. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bill. Uh, that was um, very uh, kind words and a, a lovely introduction. Thank you. And I'm really thrilled to hear the different ideas um, from my, my fellow authors, because um, it, it now it's resonating and I'm wanting to pick up threads from, from the different pieces that people have said. Um, in the, the chapter that I contributed in this book, uh, I really um, want to highlight uh, that relational approach that we're all speaking about. Um, and in, in my work and in my world, that is, is always a collaboration between the living and the dead, where the dead speak to us and we hold their stories in a way that, that highlights love um, and strength and bringing them forward. I want to go back um, to what Karen, um, the quote that Karen used from Ken that it was so poignant uh, in this, in talking about carrying the traces of our past relationships. Um, that we all do this and in, in, in the world that I want to, to embody um, where the dead are brought to life in a storied form, it, it, we are carrying their pasts with us and incorporating them into our stories of identity, incorporating them into our stories of strength, incorporating them into the stories of action um, and audience and witness as we move forward. 
Um, so just a couple of, of points I'll highlight about the work that I do. Um, one, um, uh, going back um, to what um, Marilla spoke about at the very beginning, I think that the work of remembering the dead and bringing them to life in stories is a political act, right? That there is a dominant discourse that, that supports an individual model, that it has been westernized and, and exported throughout the world, that invisibilizes and silences the stories, silences the dead, that for the last hundred years has really focused on the um, cutting the ties that bind, right? Really popular idea that prescribes the, uh, um, a healthy way in which people should breathe, be be bereaved and a healthy way in which people should die is to separate from the dead, right? Separate the stories, pull our libidinal energies away from them to quote Freud. I rarely quote Freud, <laughs> just, um, and that has produced this kind of experience where we are, are limited on how we can live with, speak about, speak to, um, those people who have traveled with us for our whole lives, who have been part of our, um, <clears throat> the lexicons of our identities, right, has been um, the, these um, people who, who have worked with us, been with us, supported us, seen us, um, and, and um, co-constructed our st stories. So when, when people die, my belief is that the relationship does not die. Dominant discourse has said that we need to limit those relationships, right? Um, when we look at a relational approach to the dying and a relational approach to the to grieving, we do not need to, to separate from those stories. In fact, we can bring them into the light. We can bring them close to us um, on a daily basis to give us a place to stand. And oftentimes that that gives us a way um, to find new stories of love, new stories of strength. In the chapter that um, uh, Bill men just mentioned um, in my chapter that I use excerpts from a conversation between myself and Cameron, where he brings to life these stories, these beautiful, beautiful stories of his grandmother. And in doing so, he is not only um, experiencing and living the, the um, places where she loves him, um, both historically, but she, he is bringing her vision of him um, to life that gives him a, a sense of agency so that he can live in the world in a very different way, right? Um, <clears throat> that these stories of, that we recapture them in a remembering context, right, is not a passive experience. Um, it is not something that it is, is in a past tense, but it is in the active conjuring of the voices of the dead. It is bringing them to life in a way that inspires hope, inspires um, our ability to stand in the world that otherwise can, can brutally tear our stories from our hearts, right? So the work that I'm doing um, the remembering work is based in work that, that Barbara Meyerhoff did, is based in narrative ideas around um, the capturing of stories it is, um, that brings Michael White's work in, in um, to, to context, um, that, that upholds a relational model that is future-oriented, right, on how the dead will travel with me and with us and with you for the rest of our lives, right? And um, that gives us um, a way in which that we can see ourselves through their eyes and and that we become better in that process, right? Um, <clears throat> it is also the, the underscoring of a love story, always, right? I'm always going to default to um, where is the best of the past that, that we can use to construct a future that where we can stand, where we can stand with um, the challenges that life faces and stand with the places in which um, love brings us closer to, to living the lives that we want to, to live, right? Um, so with that also, um, let me stop there. There's a thousand ideas I could speak about how, how to shift from a relational to, to from an individualistic model to, to a relational model um, of the dead. But I want, I want to shift into to introducing um, another fantastic chapter um, and contribution in the book um, that also highlights some of these relational and collaborative approaches. And that is the, the chapter on healthcare practices for LGBT people by um, uh, Marilla and um, Emerson. Um, and, and what I wanna speak about 
here um, when I read this, the chapter um, uh, is my um, incredible appreciation for how we are living in a place that has, um, again, individualized uh, our um, um, identities. Um, and in this instance has not collaborated with knowledges um, that are um, important um, for the people who carry the identities. Whether we're, we're speaking with somebody um, in my field of, of dying, or whether we're speaking with people who, who would identify as queer. Um, and that there has been a dominant discourse that has invisibilized that knowledge, right? Um, and so your chapter brings that forward on how do we create um, an opportunity for people at the center of the story to speak what truths matter to them, right? Um, so that the internalized languages of homophobia, transphobia um, can be separated, right? Um, and so I love that that you're bringing these um, this into focus, right? And so I'm thinking about how we are living through moments that are this rapidly changing field, right? Where we can take a step back and say, what matters here, right? What language are we going to use? What what local knowledges can we default to? And you open this door for these conversations. And you also then what I love is that you open the door that narrative practices, social constructionist practices, help us um, to step into that space, right? Um, like, I love that you cite, cite the work of um, Julie Tilson. I love that you cited the work of the Public Conversation Projects to bring that to what matters the most, right? Um, to have um, conversations of collaboration. So with that, I would love to turn this over to, to some fellow um, co-authors um, to hear more about your work that is so exciting. And I'm honored to be here with you. Thank you, Lorraine, for kind words. Hi, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Murilo, Don, and Siliani for organizing this meeting. Thank you all for being here with us. I'm going to tell you a little bit about the chapter written by Murilo and myself. Thank you, Murilo, for the partnership and for the opportunity to present our chapter today. Our chapter is entitled Healthcare Practices for LGBT People. It is divided in two parts. In the first part, we point out the contributions of gender studies to the understanding of how sexual identity categories have been socially constructed and how gender organizes our understanding of people and the world, producing narrow and polarized divisions. We consider that health services are organized from a binary gender logic, as from a logic that assumes the heterosexuality of their users. This way of organizing health services creates barriers for LGBT people access and builds discriminatory care practices, which can happen at different levels. In our point of view, Social constructionism has offered very interesting theoretical and technical resources for the production of care practices sensitive to these challenges. Thus, in the second part of the chapter, we discuss and provide illustrative examples of this kind of care practices. Considering the amount of time that we have, it's uh, so short. I will bring just one illustration of each kind of this practice. First, diagnostic practices. Which practices would be supported by depathologizing in healthcare? Teixeira and colleagues describe a set of ideas that can guide the work of a health team in transsexual care, namely, refusing the need for a psychiatric diagnosis in order to offer health care, offering psychosocial care committed to the autonomy of patients, critical review of mandatory psychological treatments, and structuring the health service, its protocols and documents in order to respect the gender identity sought by the client. The second kind of practice, practicing mental health, Working with the premise of social constructionism and queer theory, Julie Tilson, as Lorraine pointed out, 
seeks to engage her LGBT clients in an investigation into how a particular problem is produced and sustained in a discursive network committed to the maintenance of strict norms of gender and sexuality. Her work promotes the deconstruction of oppressive narrative about a client based on heteronormative and homonormative ideas and also the reconnection of the person with a dimension of social and political transformation based on an act of collective care and responsibility. The third kind of practice we say that's prevention and health promotion practice. Uh, based on constitutionalist practice for community work, we, uh, myself and colleagues, uh, develop some orienting principles for the work with transvestitis such as deconstructing and questioning the pathologizing of the transvestite experience, strengthening the support network uh, and among transvestites and between them at the social and health services, supporting various possibilities of social inclusion and employability, and finally recognizing the particularities in transvestite modes of communication and the different ways of building a network of care for themselves and others. And the fourth kind of practice, health professionals training practice. In this field, we highlight the proposal of Anzolin and Mosqueta, Murilo Mosqueta, who developed training workshops for working with LGBT people based on social constructionist guiding principles such as context creation for collaboration, in which they favor dialogue and difference over debate, producing shared understandings and common parameters in which they seek to foster curiosity and inquiry rather than offering definitions and explanations, and focus on action in which they reflect on the facts and repercussions of the possibilities of actions. The analysis of the chapters through, of this experience throughout the chapter shows how uh, constitutionist contributions have been helpful in developing health actions addressing the needs of the LGBT community. However, from a global perspective, the challenges are still immense. Moreover, the task remains to analyze how the inputs from the field of LGBT and queer studies have affected the community of social constitutionist researchers and practitioners not directly involved with this population. Um, here I finish the presentation of our chapter and now I begin uh, and I have the pleasure and honor to introduce Edgar Morales chapter entitled Mindfulness as a Generative Resource in Compassionate Healthcare. Edgardo, I have to confess that I picked up the chapter to read with a feeling of strangeness and almost suspicion. Mindfulness and social constitutionist practice? Is that possible? What kind of connections are there between them? But that feeling changed rapidly to one of curiosity and delight at the very beginning of the first paragraph of the chapter. I was captured by the tenderness of the stories you brought, Edgar. I was touched by the several short stories present throughout the chapter. I thought about your friend, the one in the first paragraph, and how is he doing? I thought that, might, that he might have a giant, and I mourned his loss. I remember my early career years when I was working with people living with HIV in the 90s and uh, what it was like to be together with them facing life-threatening situations. I was touched and moved thinking about all of that. It was in this context that I understood that you go beyond individual self-centered traditional mindfulness practices towards a stance of joint relational mindfulness and how it can help us create contexts of care, whether in extreme or everyday 
situations. For all, for all of this, thank you, Edgard. And to finish or not to finish, to keep the conversation going, I was curious to know if you have ever thought about changing the name of this idea from mindfulness to relational mindfulness. And I was wondering if those traditional individual mindfulness practices can be combined with this relational mindfulness stance. How and with what pros and cons. Thank you all for the opportunity and attention. With you, please, Edgardo. Okay. Well, uh, good morning, all of you. Uh, thank you, uh, Emerson, for your for your words. Uh, I must confess that when I was asked to write the chapter, I also uh, was faced with the same question and perhaps the same dilemma that you were you were uh, uh, talking about. Uh, given that uh, I had been a, I would say, a full participant. Uh, for more than 40 years in this tradition of mindfulness as it was brought from the West, which was uh, really centered in the, in the language of the individual and, um, and also in the language of in internal states and mind states. In addition, as we all know, um, part, of the, part of the situation or the part of the process we live now is that mindfulness has become a sort of, of a commodity uh, as something that is, is sold as, as the pill of well-being. So uh, I had both to deal with my own experiences and, and both and also my, my, um, a, my own questions about the way that it was being held and, and, and talked about. So what I tried to do in this chapter first to, to write it from, uh, from, from a personal and emotional view, I wanted to to create a story at the end, to tell a story at the beginning that not only would I hope engage the reader but also uh, pose a question that that is that is so uh, important for healthcare in terms of how do you deal with situations when you're at the margins of life and where um, uh, there are no answers that can be soothing or you know or relieving. Uh, in addition, I wanted to also, as you said, it move the, the, our view of mindfulness rather from a technique or an introspective practice, internal practice, and more as as um, as as a re, as I would call it as a re, as a, more than a relational mindfulness. It's actually more about a relational presence, which is what I talk about in the in the chapter, and maybe even talk about it more in terms of a verb as a relational presencing, a way of being with another, a way of being together, uh, bringing with it a particular way of, of, uh, of relating to the other that, that once is experienced, then you can, then you can uh, explore the just different dimensions of that way of, of presencing. And, and I make reference uh, in the article uh, or in the chapter to uh, six different qualities that that are involved in in um, in in the qualities of relational presence. I speak about deep connection, about radical inclusion, horizontality, compassionate, relational responsiveness, and attunement to the relational flow and recentering awareness. These are these are qualities that that once you move to that form of being together with another uh, are, are part and parcel of, of, that, of a relational presence that acknowledges the importance of both relationships and, if, and the importance of being present, no matter what, what emerges in the situation. Uh, as in the case with my friend, uh, which is here I am and I'm, I'm listening and I'm being present to his illness and to the possibility of his dying, you know, and, and being attentive to what is required in this situation uh, rather than being attentive to some idea of, of how you should be relating to the other. So I think this is an, an important dimension that mindfulness brings to, uh, to, uh, 
to the practice of healthcare. Finally, there's two ideas that I wanna that I wanna uh, underline. One is uh, my, the question, the, the criticism that mindfulness, as as it's sold, it's not a magic pill. It's not the solution for for caring others. It's not the solution uh, for self uh, self care. It's it, that way of thinking is sort of is excluding it from the social context where people live and people work. So uh, I try to provide at the end uh, another example uh, with my mother in uh, in the in the um, uh, emergency ward where you know where um, where we're sort of going through this situation and this you know there's understanding of how she she in this in that example she was harmed as mindfulness is not was not going to be the solution and finally i just wanted to also uh end with uh with a proposal about how we could go forward in terms of thinking about mindfulness both as an idea of a, of a way of relational presencing but it also requires would require a different type of language so we would need a language that that rather than speaking about the qualities of the self includes mindfulness in terms of the qualities of relating or ways in which mindfulness becomes a relational presence rather than an internal presence through which you can relate to others. Okay. Uh, so, Salia. <laughs> First, I have to say that I enjoyed your, your chapter. I like to say that that um, I really enjoy play. You know, I always think of what I do as playing. I when I teach, I play. I and I also think that it's sort of uh, you know uh, cooperative theater. You know, mm -hmm. so so when I do therapy, I'm always thinking about playing. And I keep telling my students, you know, that that the problem with therapists is they're too serious. You know, and if you see the, the sort of the cultural images of what mm -hmm. therapists do, and you kind of see, you know, like HBO and whatever is Showtime, they, you know, they have special, you know, counseling um, uh, on the couch or whatever the program was, and he's always serious, you know, or she's serious, and it's, so I really enjoy just putting out there the idea that that part of what you can do as part of of your work in in healthcare is is be playful. But, it, that, but also, the, you added an, another component, which is that play is not something that you do. It's something that we do together. So the doing of playfulness, the, it's, it's more about being playfulness, being playful together, and how that can be transformative. You know? So uh, that kind of, I think it's very important for me to have that kind of um, uh, that those voices, you know, that introduce this idea that play can be an important dimension of play uh, of healthcare. I think you also worked very well, you know, when you were talking about uh, sort of the dialectics and also the tensionality, you know, of of for example, if you're talking about, you know, how can you be playful or how can you bring playfulness in such a situation as, as you know, when you're dealing with end of life situations and you brought the example of the doctor who kind of is holding both this tensionality together of being with his dying father, you know, and being present at the same time. So there's this thing of letting go, which, which is part of presence and at the same time acknowledging the presence of, of, her, of his father as, as, as is being manifested in the relationship. Uh, I also enjoyed very much your examples from therapy, you know, sort of the work with multiple voices. I, I kind of felt, you know, great. This resonates with me because I keep talking, you know, when I talk to my students, I always, you know, if I'm doing supervision, I'm saying, wait a second, one of my voices is speaking to me. You know? mm -hmm. So uh, uh, there's idea that you might be schizophrenic because you keep hearing voices, you know, if you if you bring a traditionality into it. So I really, so I think this is a very important contribution. And um, and I, I, in a sense, it's sort of being selfish, I kind of felt validated, you know, great, you know, I, it, let, let's keep, let's keep uh, sort of emphasizing the importance of play, the importance of playfulness, and the importance of doing that in the transformative uh, work when you're doing with clients and in healthcare, because mm -hmm. there's so much, 
uh, solidity, fixity, uh, hierarchy in, in healthcare relationships and sort of the idea that we can sort of work around and, and make that less of a solid foundation and more of quicksand, you know, create a lot of quicksand around the solidity of relationships in mind mm -hmm. in healthcare, I thought is, uh, is was great. So I, I really, I wanted to thank you for, for your, for your chapter. Well, thank you, Edgardo. This is, um, I don't know who's validating whom really, uh, but, <laughs> but thank you for that. It, it's helpful to hear that it landed in a way that resonated for you as a, as a fellow professional in, in, in the therapy world. Um, you're absolutely right that there's such a seriousness. And when I turned in my own career to start calling what I think about a way of being in the world and that doing that you're talking about of, of doing together comes through, uh, I felt it was risky to call it play, you know, and uh, because people will not take it seriously, right? And yet, I think it's in play that we can feel that sense of being alive, yeah. which is one of the components of well-being, right? If you ask people about well-being, which, which is very interesting when Murillo and, and, and Sheila reached out about this chapter, I was like, does it belong in healthcare, right? And um, because I think it belongs in our life. And of course, everything is about our life in, in, this, in this book. So thank you, thank you for um, saying those words. And I'm going to try to see if I can just share my screen here for a second. Give me a minute. I did check this out, and here it is. Okay. Um, so I was inspired uh, when I was writing this chapter, and I have to say, folks, I'm still playing with the idea of play right? Like everything else, we're making it, we're doing this together. So this conversation helps, please ask questions. Um, I was inspired by John Chardo's work on, his, there's a chapter that he wrote, Becoming Someone, Identity and Belonging. And I often go back to Chardo's work because there is some, he's so serious, his writing is so, so challenging sometimes. But there's play in his words, there's ways of talking that he holds paradoxes and tensions. And I just enjoy that tension, if that may make sense, because it inspires me to, to, to think about what is it that we're making in this world, that social construction we talk about making, and as social beings, I see us as we are makers, right? And that we are made from relationships, we are made from the processes, from our practices, but we're also making them. So this back and forth, um, the subtitle, The Contingency and the Creativity of Human Interaction is from his um, article or chapter that I'm referring to. So I, I played with that in this chapter. And I know there's some people who are writing. Lois, if you're still here, I know you're there. So anybody who's into play, please uh, hang in there for three, four minutes. I would love to continue, to continue the conversation. So, so what is play, right? And that's the whole thing. What is play? And what I have come to, and I've been playing with this idea of play for over 20, 25 years. I do play workshops all over the world. I use theater improv games. So it's great that you call it therapy as co cooperative theater. For me, one way I talk about play is the relational create the relationally creative process of trial and error, of experimentation by which we co-create, by which we co-create ourselves, our identities, others, and the world around us. So our practices, our processes. So that, that's how I'm thinking about play. And I came to call it relational play, which is interesting because um, Emerson, you were talking about relational mindfulness and then it's qualifying the relationality of play, right? So when I started looking at well-being, it, it was pretty interesting in how those of us who, who have um, delved into well-being and psychology and the theme that has been here is how individualizing it is. It is either seen as an achievement or a repertoire, or as Dr. you're saying, mindfulness is a commodity of pill. So if I do it right, then I should be well. My well-being is in my hands, not in our collective hands, not in your relationship with me, but it's totally in me. And it's an achievement. I can then get a badge for it because now I have good health, I have good life, I have success. 
but there is no conversation about what is the production of well-being. How does that, that we talk about well-being in this way, how does that make me feel about not feeling well about myself, right? Because obviously I'm not getting it right. Um, so what I'm, I'm proposing in this chapter is that well-being is mediated through this everyday activity of relating. And we do this everyday activity of relating through improvising, through play. So another way to think about it is in Hindi, there's a word jugad, which is where I kind of come from. Jugad is um, creating under constraint. So as all the authors have been speaking, I'm offering a social relational view of well-being, where I'm inviting us to attend to our context, to our relatedness, to our interconnectedness, and to the discourses that produce the concept of well-being. It's, it's, a, it's a buzzword now, right? Like, how do we do it? So it's being often synonymously talked about as happiness. And so I want to challenge that with this concept of play where we can be very happy in play. But what do I mean by that? So I'm saying let's notice how we engage with each other. Because when we are engaging, we are in play. We don't know what might be coming next. And in that moment, we are improvising. We are creating meaning. We, we are going back and forth. But in doing all that, we are also creating connection. We are also creating the social. And noticing our noticing becomes really critical as a generator capacity, as something that we can change and move things around. So, so this really brings back that Murillo's point earlier about uh, the political, the collaborative and the creative come together in that moment, because that's part of play. So I will leave you all um, with little, uh, I, I hope little um, candy or trail to go and check out the chapter because I offer three forms of play. The play of imagination, and this really ties back to the video that Elizabeth was talking about, like the sparks of art, right? How does it invite us into dialogue? And it's I'm drawing from Bakhtin's work on the dialogic imagination here. The play of liberation. Um, how do we resist narratives that don't fit us? How do we dance in our life with those persuasive narratives or dominant discourses as Lorraine was talking about around grief and death. How do we do this thing of claiming what we want to have with those that we want to have? And last but not the least, the play of dialectics, which is, I come back to Shorter's work. Um, it's like blowing of the bubble, you know? When you blow the bubble, there's some fun in the blowing of the bubble and you want a particular bubble but then you also want to burst the bubble in a particular way. And that tension between forming bubbles and bursting bubbles, that's the tension between what is the contingent and the creative, what is emerging, what's coming. How do we hold the, and there's been a lot of chat on the chat window around that. How do we step into two worlds, right? So those are the ways that I'm talking about it. And I leave us with some resources that kind of has been spoken of already, that small gestures matter that we have to attend to the ethics of making. What are we making? What are we creating together in this world? And Susan Masad is raising that question here. When talking about relationships, what is our responsibility? What, what are we trying to do? And then remaking the familiar. Vygotsky talks about this, kids can take what's an object and break off the meaning from the object and make it into something else. So how can we remake things that are familiar, whether they're discourses, practices, ways of being, uh, roles, relationships, how do we remake it? And last but not the least, that's, it's an ongoing conversation of being alive. So I will continue to want to hear from all of you and how do you play to produce well-being? So let's take up some questions and see where we are because there was some really wonderful questions coming in. And I was going to say, uh, Morello, you wanted to jump in, yeah? Yes, yeah, Saliha, thank you so much. I, I, just before we go to the questions, I would like to mention that we have two other chapters in this section that we could not present today. The authors could not be here. So I just would like to mention then. Um, chapter 45 is called uh, Changing the Conversation, Appreciative Inquiry and Appreciative Practices in Healthcare, written by Natalie May, Julie Helslip, and Margaret Blues Organ. And chapter 46 
populating recovery, mobilizing relational sources for healing addiction from Pavel Nepostil. Uh, so do we have questions? We sure do. I, and it was really fascinating look at the chat window. Um, there was some back and forth going on uh, on two topics I want to bring in, right? So I'll, I'll take up the first one. Um, and that was, or maybe the second one, that was uh, Susan Massad uh, was talking about this question of, I'm, when we talk about relational practices, who is the relationship with and how do we see that relationship? And she's speaking as a healthcare provider. And then she goes on to talk also as a patient. So she's got her self in both worlds experiencing it. She said, uh, uh, in towards developing a truly collaborative practice of medicine, I had to reconsider many of my core beliefs of what a provider was supposed to do. Get to the bottom of things, make a diagnosis, find out what is wrong. How does this fit into the conversation? How do we create a new story together? And I think some of you were starting to respond in the chat, but I was wondering if you wanted to say more. I'm willing to take a shot at this. <laughs> Susan, this is uh, one of the big conversations that we have when we introduce collaborative care because we're trying to change exactly what you're speaking about, who's included and how they're included and how that changes our practice. And one of the stories that I think brings us home is one of the attendings early on and it continued to happen, who's responsible for teaching the new medical, you know, doctors to do exactly what you say, you know, diagnose this X, Y, Z. And he says, I can't ethically teach these people who are learning to be doctors to do it your way, to do it the collaborative way where they're not doing X, Y, and Z because they're gonna be sent out into the real world where they have to act like that. But that's the performance, right? Um, and if I only teach them, you know, this collaborative way that we're talking about here where the family is really in charge and families, you know. So, so that conversation is alive in the education. Uh, there is a, a side piece around the interprofessional education but if you listen to that, it's not enough because they don't include the family and uh, as a sort of center to that. They're more concerned with the interprofessional piece and that culture. So it's confusing, you know, where, where this conversation can actually have a home. Uh, but people like you who have the experience and all of those places uh, are, I think, the best place to start. As Elizabeth brought in, you can teach. Uh, the people who are in your circle and the, those moments and the interactive moments are where it's happening. So I'm glad you're asking this question. It's, it's uh, what I've come to call being multiply accountable. That, you know, when, when I was doing my council of elders, work where the residents were going to be presenting their heartfelt dilemmas to a bunch of people among whom were 200 or 100 year olds. They knew that when they walked out of that room, they had to be competent to their peers. But they also knew they had to make meaning with the elders and value them. Okay. And it goes back to how you can be struck by something that shifts you out of automatic assumptions. And I'm sure you found that in your work also. You can go in with an idea, but then someone will say, oh, wait a minute, this is not the way it is. So I'm sure that resonates with what you're talking about, Ellen, in terms of the team as well. Yeah, um, Karen, were you going to add? Hi, I just wanted to um, add a piece to this, which is, you know, I think as people have pointed out, there is always this tension between how to create opportunities for more collaborative and relational ways of relating 
um, in the practice of healthcare among the various actors. Um, and we can talk very, you know, of course, systemic, and we can talk very like small moment and micro. Um, but one of the things that I often say to my students, because I can get very overwhelmed with this, particularly as they become aware of the realities of the more like systemic aspects of healthcare, is that there are lots of opportunities in day-to-day -day practice. And one of the things that I thought was really beautiful, I just want to say about Saliha's chapter, was a story that she includes at the end under small gestures and rituals of connection about an interaction with, I think, an, uh, maybe an ultrasound technician or someone who was doing a test. Mm -hmm. And I thought this was a really beautiful and accessible example of how the interaction itself provided a moment of connection. Mm -hmm. And the way that the clinician did that was to share something very small about who she is as a person. And they were able to sort of connect on that level, or at least that's sort of the way I'm reading it. Yeah. So I really wanna sort of talk about this on that level as well, um, because I think as collaborative and rela relational practitioners, I think we are looking for openings um, on so many different levels of practice. I think, Karen, that's such a fantastic uh, point because I get overwhelmed too around which place. And I think this set of chapters shows that the entry points are many and we can do it at any level. But those micro interaction moments are not that micro because I literally had a somatic reaction to get going under the MRI and I was, I've never had hives. First time I got hives. And she just knew how to talk to me. And she, her, her, uh, name was Joy and we got into her family story of what it was to be hmm. called Joy and the and I don't know if I even told her I was a family therapist like how did she know to go there and next I know it was gone I was ready and that is the power of what we're talking about I think yeah thank you so much Saliham and unfortunately um, we we have to finish, we do not have more time. So um, I, I would like to thank you so much for being here. And uh, thank you, Saliha, for taking care of the chat and questions. Thank you, Don, for organizing this. And Celiani to be uh, a partner with me. And thank you all of you to to be here and say a little bit, give us a taste of what you have in this book. And I hope that everybody um, feel motivated to, to get deep into this, this section and to know these this, uh, words and ideas. I would like to say that uh, we have worked for a long time to get to this book and being here today is an opportunity to keep moving with that. For some people, I have been in contact by emails for the last two years, but this is the first time that I see your faces. So it was such a privilege to be here, to see you and to, and to celebrate that with you. Thank you so much, Morello, for being the editor of this section and putting a rich offering together. Thank you to all the authors um, and all the participants that joined us today with your questions and interest and excitement for this book. Our next dialogue with the author, which will be the last one of this series for this book, is on June 24th. And the editor of that section is Marie Hoskins. And the, the section title is Community Practices. So you'll all want to register for that one. I did put the registration link in the chat. The video for this dialogue with the author will be available on YouTube. I will also send you an email because I have all your emails um, with the video for this dialogue with the author. And we are out of time. So thank you all so much for being here and to all the authors and Morello for being the section editor. Bye-bye.